that possibly there normally is. When you see God on ground, it has a wow effect to it. So what we're saying is uh, they all slumbered and slept. There, was, there wasn't a wow effect <laughs> to, uh, that's why they slumbered, that's the terminology. At midnight, there was a cry made. Uh, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And we said that cry had to be something unusual. Because we can sleep through anything if it's normal humdrum. We can live alongside of a train track or a highway and sleep through that because it's a normal thing. But there was something about this cry that awakened both the wise and the foolish. So there had to be something, we'll say, in this generation that had a wow factor to it. It had something about it that awakened the virgins to the coming of the Lord. Malachi, I'm just going to do a review. Uh, I want to get somewhere if I can. Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. We all know this. Verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And we understand the great day and the dreadful day are two different. There's a big time frame in between. The great day is when Jesus Christ was on ground himself 2,000 years ago, healing the sick, fulfilling Isaiah 61, all of the wonderful things he did. That was the great day. <laughs> There was nothing greater than when Jesus Christ was on ground. The dreadful day is the day of the Lord, the end of the age when God wraps it up, destroys the sinner, and all of that. So when we look at that, we have to put the grace age in between there. So what that is actually saying is that the spirit of Elijah will come at the beginning of the age, the spirit of Elijah will come at the end of the age. That's just, if I didn't know anything, the common wording of that tells me, tells me that. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. That was fulfilled, we know, with John the Baptist. And when you read the New Testament account, when John is on ground, the expression is used all the time when, they're, when he's preaching. Fathers, elders, that expression is used all the time. Because he was, we can say, the children in that, in that fulfillment. Uh, the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. It's so remarkable the way those two verses are written. We, when you break down verse 5, the two comings of the spirit of Elijah, the start of the age, the end of the age, and when you break down verse 6, the spirit of Elijah at the first of the age and at the end of the age, just the wording of it. it isn't that wonderful that God shows himself that way? The religious world, or especially the, the uh, unbelieving world, there's nothing inside of them that lights up when they read the Word of God. But to the child of God who is filled with the Holy Ghost, there's something inside of you comes alive. When you begin to see God's footprints, when you begin to see what He is saying, what He is doing, it's a, it's a tremendous thing. 12, but I say unto you that Elijah is come already, referring to John the Baptist. And the consistency of how the scriptures are worded and how they're structured appeals to me. 
it, it gives me a settled feeling that my revelation is stable. There's, to me, there's not, it's a terrible feeling to be unsettled in what you're looking at. If there's a question in your mind, then it's a not, it's a, it's a, in my own personal life, I refuse to live like that. And I realize we have times like that. But when there's a question, I want it, I want it answered for the sake of my own soul. Um, there's so much information that we can feed into this. Um, let's just go to Revelation. I, I want to focus our, our attention on a certain time frame that's up there, the three watches, because the scripture are worded confirming that what's up there. That's just a visual, uh, something that we can look at, but the scriptures are worded in such a way that vindicates that that is the truth. And that's the way it should be. When, when God says something, especially if he says something new, he will always confirm, reconfirm, strike it at a different angle, expand it, confirm it, and reconfirm it. God will never say anything that he cannot or he will not Reconfirm. How, how many understand that? And if I may say at this point, that is why there has to be a fivefold ministry that recognizes a spiritual head. And when they recognize that spiritual head and that word of God, they take it and feed it. They feed it, but they say it in different words. They, they strike it from a different angle. But all it does is expand it. It makes it more wonderful, and it's God's way of confirming and reconfirming what he has already said. And to me, that is so wonderful. And that's, that's the plan of God. That's the way he, he brings his bride to completion. That's the way he brings unity. It has to be that way. So, Revelation chapter 10, let's just read it, and uh, we'll try to look at something. Revelation chapter 10, we know that that's ahead of us. And where my mind went this week, uh, in science, uh, scientists sometimes they look at something and they say, I know this has to be that way in the universe. I cannot prove it, but I know it has to be this way. And sometimes uh, quite a few years have to go by when scientists start to look at it and say, yeah, what he said way back here, we, we've just proved Einstein, different things that he said. It took time to go by to prove his thought. And if I may say, that's the way the Bible is written, that's the way the plan of God works. God says something, and it might be strange to our ears, but if we will be still, 
if we will be patient, God will confirm it and reconfirm it, not only by the primary voice, but by the fivefold ministry that will feed into it. How many understand the simplicity of that? The wondrous things of that? Because that's God speaking. That's not humans. <laughs> to our, to humans are just the carrier. Humans is just the DNA that you're looking at. But the, the inspiration that God is doing and displaying that, that's him. That's him in action. And that's what prepares the bride. That's what separates the bride from the foolish and the religious world. She is recognizing God's footprints and she is allowing that it was granted that she should be clothed in fine linen. And I used to look at that years ago and think, wow, what a super duper bunch of people. But they're not. They're just ordinary. They're just ordinary people that believe the word of God. And to reconfirm that, when we looked at the first chapter and the second chapter of Luke, when Jesus was born the first time, it was just simple, ordinary people that gathered to him. It wasn't the educated. It was, and so is the bride today. Matt, uh, Revelation chapter 10. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his feet as it were a sun, as the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. Now, I don't have any new revelation. We understand what that is. When the seventh seal is finally broke, then this angel in Revelation 10 comes down. It is that angel characterizing Jesus Christ that that judges the bride, that gives her, her her reward for the millennium, and that has a spin-off effect. You cannot have that going on in a positive way and not have a spin-off negative way. How, ma how many understand that? Without bringing a lot of things. So that is an event that is ahead of us. We understand that. That's nothing new to us. The book being open means that that seventh seal is now broke because that seventh seal is what's holding the book closed right now. So that seal has to be broke so that book is open. So it is open there and he set his right foot on that sea and his left foot on the earth. And that's worldwide. That's a universal and he cried with a loud voice. That is not just a noise. When he cries with a loud voice, that has to be actual words. That has to be an actual revelation that is filtered down to the body of Christ. And it's dynamic. <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's the lion roaring. So there's something carried within that voice. It's a message. It's a revelation that, if I may say that, when that happens, there is going to be something lit inside of you. There is, there is going to be a, an intensity. <laughs> what words can I put on it? When that actually happens, there will be an intensity on it that you cannot manufacture. That's just the way the plan of God is. Cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So, based on what the angel cried, like a lion, those seven thunders uttered their voices in response to what the angel cried with a loud voice. Isn't that what that says? The, he cried uh, with a loud voice as when a lion roared, and when he had cried, seven thunders. So seven earthly people 
that are known to the body of Christ. They're not strangers coming out of the woods. They will receive that revelation and minister it to the body. As I said earlier, within the ministry, it, such a beautiful thing that they grab and take the same revelation and minister it to the body worldwide so that we all believe alike. <laughs> it has to be that way or this, this, this is going to go on forever. But I would look at something that, uh, that shows some wording. Seven thunders uttered a voice. And when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. So I suppose uh, if John was allowed to write it, it would be distorted by now. <laughs> Everybody would have their version of what those thunders will say. But when those thunders do speak, it's only the bride of Christ that will embrace that. It will be that late in, this, in the time frame that only the bride of Christ will receive that. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. And we understand that's how the translators they use there should be time no longer. But what that actually means is there's, there is no delay. There is no delay. And when you open your mind and say, there is no delay, you, when you look at that, when there's no delay, you have to have a starting point and you have to have a finishing point. Or else there's no way to know in what relationship you're saying those words. There is no delay. And where my mind had gone, when you look at Malachi, Malachi, that prophet, the last prophet in the Old Testament, it was 400 years before John the Baptist come on ground. There was a long interval of time. If you look at the Grace Age, there was long, long intervals of time between where God put his footprint. And you could say, that is God. That is a move of God. He is doing such and such. How many understand that? There's long periods of time. But this, when he says there's no delay, what the angel is actually saying is this, when God focuses on this time frame, Three watches, when God focuses on that time frame. And that's where God is focusing tonight. When God focuses on that, there is not going to be any delay in revelation. There is going to be a consistent revelation after revelation after revelation until it ends. Because... There has never been that in history. God has not done that. There's been long spaces of time. So when, when you read the whole parables of the New Testament, it all focuses on that time frame, a lot of it. So that there should no delay that time, there should be time no longer or no delay. Now, <clears throat> the, the way the next <clears throat> verse is worded, it gives you a starting point. He says, but, there is no delay, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. So you have to take the voice of the seventh angel 
as your starting point. That is where there's going to be no delay. How many understand that? That's how that's all structured. And I'll try to get at something else. So the voice of the seventh angel wasn't 1933, although he was on ground ministering. The voice there is 1963 where fresh revelation was dropped to the body of Christ, which gave them a fresh, uh, expanded view of the coming of Jesus Christ. Up until then, there was just a certain amount of anticipation, but when the seals were preached, that started, or that opened up, that season where there will be no delay. So, <clears throat> but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. So, that's, we understand that's a progressive thing. So, what it is saying, that when that watch starts, when the scriptures are focusing it's not, that revelation is not going to end until it's finished. And that's why the wording is so beautiful to me. It, it's so satisfying the way it's wording. Because when Jesus does come off the mercy seat, what does it say? It says there's silence. Because there's no more Revelation coming, <laughs> coming out of the throne. All of the focus is on Jesus Christ. He is the leader. He is the head. He is the one that's bringing this all about, of, of course, through the eternal spirit, through angelic beings. But Jesus Christ, when, that, when this is finished, there is silence. It's over. And the way I like to look at it, you could be driving by a construction site. And every day you go by, there's bulldozers, there's excavators, there's front-end loaders, there's everything. There's men going one way or the other. And they're going, they could go for months or years. But one day you go by, nothing going on. It's done. It's finished. So what this is saying is what... The revelation that God has given us in this hour is absolutely accurate. It, and it's, you'll see that it's more accurate as time moves on. Because God is vindicating and vindicating and adding to it. And it grieves me, it upsets me that ministers won't take a hold of it and minister it to their people. Because that's the only way it's going to get done. These seven thunders, these seven voices, there has to be somebody that picks that up. And God said some things in mind. Uh, it's not only going to surprise the world, <laughs> it'll surprise the movement, and it'll be shocking to me. There has to be something that, that does that. My point in saying all of that, and there's lots more information you could feed into it, is when you look at the scriptures, God is focusing on that time frame of the three watches. And there's no delay. There's, if I may use human people, when Brother Branham was on ground, Brother Jackson was standing there looking at it. And the revelation just continued on. When Brother Jackson died, the ministry was standing there looking at it, and the revelation just carried on. That's, that's what the scripture... That's why when that seventh seal is broken, there is silence. It's over. It's finished. It's the wrap up. Heavenly Father, cause these words now make, cause them to make sense. Thank you for your wonderful grace and mercy to us. Dismiss your children now with your blessing. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.